All right, can you see, can you see our class? I do not see it. Oh, no. Maybe. How about now? Maybe? It, it says live. It works. It works. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to 6837. Uh, we have a wildly complicated offering because we're in a pandemic. Uh, but it's exciting to see all of you, and I hope to see at least a few of you in our next lecture. Uh, right. Uh, <laughs> we're going to wait on questions for just a minute. Um, right, so hopefully you are all in the right room. We are in 6837, that is MIT's Introduction to Computer Graphics course. Uh, I'm your instructor, uh, Justin Solomon. I'm a professor in EECS and CSAIL uh, down the hallway here. I'm guessing most of you are course six majors, but not all. I looked at the list. So we're going to start today's class with the usual boring administrative stuff, which is also a chance for me to remember how to talk to humans in a room. And then we'll have a quick introduction to what we'll be covering in 6837, you know, the usual Q&A that happens at the beginning of a course like this, and then we'll send you on our way. And then in our next lecture, we will dive right into the technical stuff. In fact, the way 6837 is kind of structured, I feel like the second lecture is like one of the mathier ones, so hopefully we won't scare you all away. Okay, so uh, again, uh, I'm Justin. I have taught 6837 more times than I can count. Uh, and we have the pleasure of having four teaching assistants I believe at least one of them is here. Um, so at least one of them will be in each lecture here, uh, and they have many different office hours. So if you go onto canvas.mit.edu and open this course, you should all see it listed in your pile of stuff. Uh, then you can find all the office hours. We are going to attempt to do kind of a hybrid office hours scenario, as many of you have probably already experienced. It's really hard to have office hours in person. It's also hard to have them online, and we're going to try and do both. So we're going to ask for everybody's patience as we figure out this crazy uh, semester here. And there may be a little bit of adjustment as we kind of see what works and what doesn't. So to cover some more of the basic boring information, uh, not to worry, all of these slides are posted on Canvas. You don't need to write down these links. Um, we're going to use this Canvas site to post your grades, your assignments, and so on. And then we have a Piazza site, which I added everybody who is registered to this class as of about an hour ago, I added to Piazza. I ask that you please use that site to contact your instructors so, and, and to contact each other. So in particular, um, every year I get a lot of emails from students directly, and that's great, but it means that I'm the one that has to help you and not the many qualified people in this course. And while it's always my pleasure to hear from our students and I love interacting with you all, you're, you're more likely to get a fast response with, more eyeballs looking at your, your posts here. Um, I'm an old man, and uh, Canvas is confusing and scary to me, so I use a much simpler way to uh, manage our course calendar. So there is a Google Sheet that is mar uh, linked on the Canvas site. It has the date and topic of every lecture, the date of all the assignment due dates, uh, the date of the quiz, when the nano quizzes are, all that good stuff. Um, so if you send me a scheduling question, I'm just going to send you the link to that thing. I know that that's not standard for MIT courses, but I actually find this to be less clunky than like this weird giant Canvas calendar thing. Um, this year is, <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, <laughs> it's kind of a weird year, and it's not just weird for, for you guys, also for your instructors. Um, I would love to see all of your faces, and it is so much fun to teach in person, and I really encourage and hope that you all show up. It's why I'm paid and I'm happy to do that. However, if you feel sick, I don't want you here. <laughs> okay, and, and unfortunately, because of the way MIT has kind of set this up, you're responsible for all the in-person content, but then if you're sick, you're not supposed to show up, and I know MIT students don't always pay attention to that second half, but in this year, that really matters. So I'm going to try and disincentivize that. Um, so what we're experimenting with, and Zoe has kindly helped me today, uh, is I'm going to try and stream our lectures on YouTube. I panicked last week and went to Best Buy and bought this like weird, complicated camera scenario. Um, I'm like kind of amazed that this laptop is able to, and we're going to talk about how in this course, is able to take film, put it into the camera, composite with the slides, put the slides on the screen, which are going through this thing over here, and also put them all on the internet at like 29.97 frames per second. It's like super cool to me, but it's also likely to fail. <laughs> so here's the scenario. Um, if it fails, you are still responsible for the course content. All right, I'm making eye contact with you all because 
I don't want that email where it's like, well, the lecture thing broke down, so I'm not going to expect to see this on the quiz kind of thing. Um, unfortunately, uh, they, they did not choose to film this course, so this is a backup option officially. Um, the other experiment we're going to try this year, uh, if you go onto Canvas, there is a link to a Slack website. How many of y'all have used uh, Slack before? <laughs> cool. Um, okay, so in that case, you'll have no uh, trouble. If you didn't raise your hand, that's actually fine. I'm sure you can figure it out. Uh, so if you open up the Slack site, uh, there's like a channel we're going to post for each lecture with a link to the live feed thing. Um, and also, uh, you can post questions there. So if you don't feel like raising your hand and asking a question in class, while that makes me sad, you're also welcome to put the question there and, and one of our TAs can voice them in lecture. Um, does anybody want to practice that now? We can, we can test our TA. Any questions? Ah, y'all killing me. I was like really excited for that moment to see what uh, interesting question came up and, and nothing. Okay, but I'm sure there will be some more uh, later on. Okay, uh, continuing in our boring... Oh, there's a question! What's the TA's name? What's the TA's name? Zoe Marginer. Fabulous question. <laughs> any, any others? Okay, uh, right. So here's how your grades are determined. Uh, I think this class is pretty straightforward as classes go here at MIT. Um, so the basic thing is structured around uh, lectures. There are a bunch of assignments, and by a bunch, I mean five. <laughs> um, and they're at a cadence of roughly one every two weeks. I say roughly because toward the end of the semester, this year, like where Thanksgiving lands makes things a little complicated. Um, so double check the calendar and make sure you put them all into your personal calendars now. Um, and these are really what's going to expose you all to common practice and computer graphics. You're basically going to implement all the pieces of a video game pipeline and uh, ray tracing, which I think is pretty cool. Um, in addition to that, there's an extremely open-ended final project. We'll come back to that a little bit more. Um, there is a midterm quiz. We scheduled that before the drop deadline, and then our goal is to get you the grade for that quiz before that, just in case that's a uh, consideration. And then finally, we have these things called nano quizzes. Now, in the past, those were intended to incentivize you all to come to class, but you might have noticed the theme here, which is that I don't feel like I can do that kind of thing in 2021. So um, the nano quizzes will still happen, but they're going to be more to hold you responsible for the course content, and you'll have like basically a 24-hour window to complete them at your, your leisure, as, as one does. Any questions about grading or the basic kind of components of this course? I think it's like totally boring, straightforward college course setup. Excellent. I, you know, I was really nervous that like the Zoom silence was, I wasn't going to know how to cope without it, but I'm glad you, you, you're all helping me uh, uh, simulate it uh, regardless. Um, so I usually get a bunch, a bunch of questions about background material that's required for 6837, especially because MIT's computer science curriculum kind of steers toward the theoretical side a little bit. Um, our assignments will be in C++, not really C. Um, there's, we're going to have an optional review intro session led uh, by one of our TAs on the 10th at 3 to 4. Uh, we will share the location as soon as that location is shared with me. Um, we'll additionally have a new uh, session on a, uh, the graphics library that we're going to be using to implement your assignments. I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend that you attend. Um, so here's the thing. All of our assignments will be implemented in this library called GLOO. This is like OpenGL object-oriented, um, which is kind of one layer above OpenGL. And it's a very typical kind of setup for a game engine. Um, game engines are really complicated, and they're hard to work with. And this is the worst possible way to learn C++, because it's so complicated. But that's OK, because none of the MIT undergrads have seen C++, so we're going to figure it out together. Um, however, I think the first time you open this thing, there's just so many moving parts, it's easy to get lost. And so we've asked our TAs to kind of organize a session where they basically do Homework Zero together with you to kind of get some idea of what this looks like, how to compile your code, run it, all that good stuff. And then finally, uh, we'll have a Calculus Linear Algebra uh, review session on the 20th uh, in case you need a little bit of refresher on that front. Um, I do not check prerequisites carefully for this course. I know many of you come from different backgrounds. You're coming from different places, and that's fine. This is a proceed at your own risk kind of scenario. Any questions? Yes? Will these sessions be recorded or like available after in case you can't make some? That's a good question. Um, question mark. We'll come back to you. Yeah. 
Uh, <laughs> anything else I can uh, not answer? Ah, okay. All right, so almost done. And then we'll do graphics, I, I promise. Um, so uh, on your assignments, uh, all of the big assignments in this course are code. <laughs> Please be sure to actually submit your code when you submit your assignments. Just submitting an executable won't do it. Um, there's also instructions that tell you to send a README file with your code and tell us a little bit of feedback, all that good stuff. Um, in terms of collaboration policy, you are welcome to interact with one another and with the course staff. That's great. Um, at the end of the day, you do have to write your own code and, and submit. I think that's pretty standard. Uh, the course project can be done in pairs. And I believe that like the way the, the, the grading policy works, like if you work in a pair, you're judged the same as if you didn't. So it's your incentive is to like make a friend. Uh, and we can help with that. Okay, um, is this fun or what? We, we still haven't had any technical content. Uh, the course has late days. You can, uh, there are three late days that you don't have to give an explanation. I don't care. Um, you can turn in your homework late. These are 24 hour cycles, not like lectures, because that would be a ridiculous amount. Um, beyond that, your late assignments lose 25% additively per day. This is not a compound interest scenario because I'd like to be able to grade your assignments in finite time. Um, and then finally, uh, you can collaborate, just don't do anything that I wouldn't do. <laughs> okay, so that is the end of our boring beginning of course setup stuff. Does anybody have any questions uh, I can answer about the mechanics of 6837? Am I like yelling loud enough through this face mask? I can't quite tell. Cool. That's, I, I usually lose my voice after giving lecture and I feel like this is <laughs> only going to make it <laughs> worse, but that's okay. Okay, so our plan today is to give you a very high-level overview of what the computer graphics discipline is. You know, I feel like there are some courses, especially in computer science, where there's like this very well-defined path through topics that all build on one another, and then there are other areas that are kind of like just big piles of different topics that are all glued together under one heading, and computer graphics is definitely in that latter category. And so that's good and bad. What it means is that this course is going to cover a ton of different topics some of which will probably be really exciting to you, and some of them may be less so. And that's okay, because a week later we'll be doing something else. Um, it also means that if you get a little bit lost in this course, you should not disappear on me. All right, no, it's uh, acknowledgement. Because probably when you come back, there's a new topic anyway, and it's okay. Okay, so like I see there's always, you know, as the semester gets busy, people get frustrated or whatever, and then they drop off. And, and, and there's no reason for that, because uh, like essentially most of the lectures stand on their own. So today, we're going to talk about the computer graphics pipeline at a high level and give you a preview of what we'll be covering in this course, as well as a preview of how those will get kind of echoed into the course assignments. So let's start with a bit of a, an overview of the computer graphics discipline here. So my main question for you all, when I use the phrase computer graphics, what sort of applications come to mind? Yes? Video games. Video games, absolutely. Yeah. Animated what was that? CGI. CGI. Yes? Animating charts, Animating charts, absolutely. You are looking at computer graphics on this screen right now. Any others? CAD? CAD, yeah, computer-aided design. 3D printing is often included. Yeah? Rendering, Rendering sure. Yes? Simulation? Simulation. That's a good list. Some of those I would consider computer graphics tasks, other of those computer graphics applications, and they're all great. Now, graphics is one of these funny areas where it's sort of defined by who hangs out with graphics people rather than a lot of anything else. Um, but graphics technology and roughly kind of visual computing technology more broadly is basically unavoidable in your everyday life. I mean, I see a bunch of computer screens in front of me with eyeballs that are looking down instead of at their instructor. Um, uh, in addition to that, there's a screen here, there's a screen there, there's one over here. I've got one sitting on my wrist. And all of these things are running different computer graphics algorithms that are set up for different settings. So probably the obvious application of computer graphics that we all think of is uh, CGI, you know, like computer generated imagery and movies, special effects. Uh, for some reason in my mind, like the, <laughs> the high point of computer graphics special effects are these like goofy Transformers movies, I don't know why, but basically any film that you go out and watch right now, it's going to be digitally edited, you know, some of them you know, Optimus whatever is like unfolding and it's pretty clear that there's some, some computer graphics going on. But even in really realistic films where you wouldn't expect, there's probably some digital editing, editing and, and careful work going on behind the scenes. 
very few of the things that you see in your TV screen and on the movies are just like direct captures of real life. That's just not a thing anymore. And it's actually really more than you would expect. So one of my favorite hobbies is to go onto YouTube and watch these special effects reels where they like take shots in a movie and then they just decompose them into like all the different pieces that go into composing a single shot. Um, here's, here's a kind of fun one from the Avengers. Let's, let's just watch for a minute and you can see just all the cool pieces that go into one of these. I'm relying on the internet. We'll see. Maybe. Computer graphics. Ah, there, okay. All right, so this is from one of the, uh, the big uh, studios, of course. And essentially what these reels do is they just take a few shots from the movie and then just show all the different effects that get combined together. So sometimes there's some physical stuff and then digital things being composited on top. You can see in this case, <laughs> there's even a human character which is actually digital. <laughs> this entire thing is a 3D model. I could watch these all day. I'm going to watch one more of these, then I'll get back to teaching. Right, so hopefully you guys can appreciate it. And the, and the more that you watch these things, the more just incredible it is that just the role of computation in any modern film is just overwhelming. So cool. Now this type of computer graphics programming is especially fun for, for people like me that kind of like to do math and don't like systems because the good news is that like it doesn't matter how long it takes to generate one of these frames because they just get combined into the movie later. On the other side is a type of programming which some of you guys uh, uh, mentioned which is making video games and the demands in that universe are completely different than in the movies. Right? So for example, uh, when I was at Pixar many years ago, you would simulate, you know, fluids and cloth and everything going on in these movies and it would take maybe a few hours per frame uh, to generate one of these. Uh, in a video game, you have a 29.97 frame per second limit before your eye notices that the game had a problem, right? And so if you want to make computer graphics video games, Essentially, what you're forced to do is to use that budget of time to generate as much interesting visual content as possible. And so there's some really fascinating computational trade-offs here. Not just like, how can I make my algorithm faster? But for example, do I spend my time making really good physical simulation or really good rendering because I only have so much time and that little fraction of a second to spend, and which one of those is going to have the better effect for the guy playing the video game? Um, and so, of course, video game graphics have developed all kinds of interesting ways from photorealistic human characters to like weird QB things in this Minecraft game that I don't understand um, and, and just about everything in between. But these aren't the only, you know, those are the two obvious applications of graphics, but it's literally unavoidable. You see computer graphics in simulation. If you want to get your pilot's license, chances are you've probably played in a simulation of a uh, flying environment, thank God, before you're actually in the airplane. Uh, one of our colleagues over here mentioned computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacturing. Essentially, every object that you pick up in the grocery store probably was a 3D model on someone's computer before it was manufactured. And essentially, all of the surfaces that you see are composed of things like piecewise polynomial patches, which we'll cover in this course. Um, these are a nice piece of architecture, chances are, you use computer graphics technology, not just for like a fun virtual walkthrough, but also to actually analyze the piece of architecture that you're creating. So for example, later in this course, we're going to talk about the ray tracing algorithms. Just, how many of us have heard of ray tracing before? I'm guessing a lot. Yeah. Um, ray tracing is not just a rendering technique. It, it absolutely is that. But it's also a way to analyze things like how heat is going to diffuse around in your building thanks to the light coming into the windows. And so actually these serious architecture tools are being developed 
not just to use ray tracing to give you like a fun virtual walkthrough of the building, but also to help you understand energy efficiency and other issues. Moreover, uh, we're going to talk about simulation tools in computer graphics. We're going to talk about how to make, you know, explosions or little micro ones because this is the intro class. Um, and exactly the same simulation algorithms are being used in engineering environments to make sure your building isn't going to fall over. In fact, a lot of the state of the art simulation tools that get proposed in computer graphics uh, world really are, are exactly the same kind of finite element things that people use to analyze actual structures in the real world. So, I mean, this is one of the early applications, really. I don't know why it has this tune attached to it. Um, you know, this is one of the early drivers of some of the graphics technology. And these days, if you're going to build yourself a custom, you know, condo or whatever, you can basically have a VR walkthrough of what it's going to look and feel like before you actually enter this place, which is pretty exciting and pretty cool. Moreover, these days, of course, thanks to augmented reality tools, not only can you do that, but you can actually, like, if you want to buy a piece of furniture, pull out your phone, point the camera at some corner of your house, and actually preview what the, you know, the furniture that you're looking to buy will look like in the area uh, of your house that you're planning to place it. If you think about it, that in itself is an extremely challenging problem because not only are you doing rendering, you're doing computer vision and you're incorporating those two together. So indeed, one of the big driving technologies for graphics is VR. VR is one of these fascinating areas of technology where about once every 10 years we get really excited about it and then it fails. And we're like right in that like kind of region once again, right? Um, there are all kinds of interesting VR headsets and for all we know, this is the time when VR is going to finally uh, make its penetration into the market. Um, and indeed, a lot of the issues that really held back virtual reality in the past, namely latency issues involving, you know, like there's nothing worse than wearing one of these headsets and turning your head and then like your eyeball turns like a second later. Um, that kind of thing just doesn't happen anymore, um, which is a big step forward in this technology uh, and one of the sort of major hurdles to overcome in order to make people not vomit while they wear their, their VR headset, uh, which seems to be kind of an important thing uh, when it comes to promoting this technology to the broader world. These days, virtual reality technology varies widely from specialized headset kind of things, augmented techniques, to a cardboard box that attaches to your phone and has two little lenses. And it turns out that all of these work remarkably well. And there's lots of applications too, right? So for example, uh, people talk about visualization, understanding scientific systems and so on. Um, actually, the computer graphics domain has developed all kinds of cool physical simulation and visualization technologies, which dot, 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 may show up on my screen. Any second now. Yeah, so one thing that we don't work on is internet bandwidth. Um, and I blame all of you people with your laps out. Um, right, so if you go to a typical computer graphics conference right now, actually it looks like this because we're in a pandemic and it's really frustrating going to online conferences. But that aside, what you'll see is a really amazing work that I would consider to be the start for solving a lot of problems. And the exact same tools that are being used to to make really cool visual effects and movies are also being used to advance the scientific and visualize what's going on both mathematically, physically, and otherwise, and so on, understand some of the physical phenomena that we see in day life. I absolutely these kinds of things because even the negative examples where they're telling you that like their algorithm failed just look beautiful to me. Like smoke and so on, basically numerical tools for solving these largely came out of the computer graphics, which and that's the, we have a big demand for simulating these with a high level of reality. Laundry list, of course, went to the hospital today. Computer graphics technology is all the time. Uh, your instructor screwed up his shoulder bench pressing a couple months ago, and I had my first MRI, and I had so much fun after.
oh my god, look, you can look this thing and make this 3D model and rotate it. And so I was like the worst kind of customer at this place. I took a CD home and like loaded it into my laptop and realized that I'm not a radiologist. But uh, the reality is that graphics technology can be used to do surgery, to take cuts through our necessity. Every time we develop a new piece of technology, piece of electronics, computer graphics is sort of the very first piece of the puzzle that has to go into how that interacts with the person on the receiving end. So now let me tell you a little bit about what we'll cover in this course. So 6837 is a computer science course, and that has a few implications for what we will and will not do in this course. So really our focus in 6837 are the fundamentals of what it means to build a computer graphics system. This includes, I'm very sad to say, a lot of math. So we're going to talk about all the different ways of representing a scene on your computer and eventually digitally transmitting it all the way to your eye, going all the way from virtual representation of objects in a 3D universe to just a big grid of pixel colors and how that gets communicated into a device like this one or the one that's hanging over your head. We will talk about the basics of real-time rendering and the basics of OpenGL. I keep using this phrase OpenGL. If you've never heard of it before, that's OK. OpenGL is essentially one of the big computer graphics libraries that's used to interact with your graphics card in your laptop or your PC. Um, it's not the focus, though. So there are computer graphics like tutorials out there on the internet that have all kinds of crazy hacks for like weird things you can do on your graphics card. That changes once every like six months. And so really the focus here is going to be on like what's going into that technology and the basic techniques rather than like the latest way to like make, you know, like Elsa's hair look a little cooler and, and, and on your graphics card or, or whatever. Um, we're also going to cover C and C++ programming. Strangely at MIT, this is not part of the undergrad curriculum until pretty late. And so we do not expect that you've uh, had exposure to that before coming into this course. Just so we mitigate your expectations and disappoint you now, there are some things that we will not cover in 6837. Um, so we're not going to do a bunch of hacks involving the latest version of your graphics card and OpenGL. By the way, this has changed drastically in the presence of machine learning, right? We talk a lot about GPU programming and machine learning, and the G in GPU stands for graphics. Um, we're not going to cover a bunch of software packages. This is not an art course, and it's not a computer-aided design course. Um, and so if you're looking for artistic skills, I promise you that I am the wrong person to teach it to you. Um, I can try and draw your portrait for you if you like, and you will, you will quickly come to the same conclusion. Typical questions we get, how much math? Almost all of our math involves 3x3 three three and 4x4 four four matrices. Um, that's what we're going to be doing a lot of in this course. Um, I think that's great. I think that oftentimes linear algebra is taught quite poorly. Um, not that I would ever throw shade at my colleagues in the math department, but 4x4 four four matrices are really concrete objects with intuition that we can work. And so the nice in this course is if you were a little shaky with your linear algebra, you won't be by the end of the semester. I can guarantee you that. Um, moreover, we'll cover a few advanced math concepts, advanced in kind of quotation marks. Um, this includes uh, homogeneous coordinates, um, ordinary differential equations, and, and, and their simulation. And we're going to have one pictorial lecture that talks about Fourier transforms and anti-aliasing. We're not going to do a single integral. I might draw one on the screen because it's part of my professional contract. But um, really, it's just to give you some intuition for like why somebody might care about the frequency domain. There are many other courses at MIT that cover that in great detail, and I can send you over there. Um, and the really fun thing about graphics, you might notice your, your instructor just really likes this domain, um, is that everything is really concrete. You know, like you're going to be writing code to render and make visual stuff, and your bugs are going to be able to, like, they're things that you're going to see. <laughs> um, and so when you have like issues in your code or a lack of understanding, I, I, to me, this is one of the most tangible ways to kind of work through that um, relative to some other abstract domains. And the fun thing is that these are tools that are really useful even besides computer graphics. You know, essentially all the tools that we're developing here are also the core of scientific computing, um, simulation, and even some uh, statistics learning integration and so on. I should pause really quick. Are there any questions about this course, what we're structured or covering, that kind of thing? Cool. So to give you a quick preview, um, there will be five plus one assignments in this class. Um, the assignment zero does not count for credit, but I strongly, strongly recommend that you do it. Um, 
you guys are mostly used to coding in Python, which is a kind of programming language that you can just open up, start writing code, and hit the big green button, and it runs. Um, C++ is not like that. There's like a bit of an apparatus you have to set up to like compile and run your code and get used to. And so essentially, assignment zero is to make sure that you have everything on whatever machine you intend to use for this course uh, set up in a way that you can you do everything. Um, what that means is you are more than welcome to discuss any aspect in as much detail for, as you want for assignment zero on the course Piazza. It's fine to copy paste your answer. I don't care because it's not worth any credit. Beyond assignment zero, that's not the case. <laughs> um, there's also going to be that review section where we're going to cover and go through parts of that to, to get some idea. Um, I strongly, strongly recommend you do assignment zero. If you come to me doing assignment one and there's like a weird problem that kind of demonstrates the lack of understanding, that's going to be my first question. Um, and then there are five that actually count for, for credit here. And we'll, we'll go and show you a little bit of pictures of what we'll be doing in a minute. There's also an open-ended project. Graphics is one of these domains that like, is just really like seven domains glued together. For example, your instructor is a geometry researcher. My background is in differential geometry and PDE, but somehow I'm teaching a graphics class. That actually makes sense. But uh, what that means is like for me, I'm personally like not super excited about how your GPU works. Like I'll teach it because that's my job, but like I'd much rather teach you some of the mathy stuff. Um, others of you maybe are really excited about hardware, and that's fine too. You're confusing to me, but that's fine too. Um, so essentially, in order to let you guys explore your personal interest in this area a bit, there is an open-ended project where essentially the project is find an interesting advanced thing that we don't cover in this course, kind of adjacent to something that we do, and implement it. Right? So you can find a research paper, a cool tutorial, something like that. Um, the instructions are already on Canvas. I know every year about five or ten students in this class basically are only here for this part. Um, if you're not, that's also fine. <laughs> Um, and uh, you, you're more than welcome to look there. It's a pretty standard project. There's a proposal, a check-in, a presentation. That's, that's about it. And this is in lieu of a final exam. So there's no final in this, uh, this course. All right. Any, uh, any questions about uh, that, that aspect here? Yes? How do we turn on our assignments? Do we like, post our code on the Canvas site, or do we have a GitHub yeah, so the question was, how do you turn in your assignments? Um, so you'll, you'll zip them all together and uh, upload them onto Canvas, and there will be instructions on how to do that. Um, incidentally, we do reuse these assignments from year to year. Um, it's really hard to come up with a new set of graphics assignment annually. These are big systems. So we ask that like, your assignments one through five, maybe you don't share the code for. Uh, your final, pr I know it leaks out anyway. Don't be jerks and cheat, guys, seriously. Um, the final projects, you're more than welcome to share. It's, it's fine. A great question. And any other uh, things I can address? All right. I think I'm not calibrated timing-wise. I keep looking at this clock. OK, so now let's talk a little bit about sort of what we'll cover this semester. So I've already motivated all the many reasons why you might care about computer graphics. I noticed we lost only one student in the process. Uh, but now let's talk a bit about what's going on behind the scenes. So for example, here we have a, uh, an image of a Tractor? What do you call that? Tractor. Uh, and, and it's composited together in a scene with nature and wood and laws and so on. And the basic question is how did we get from some digital description of the scene all the way to what you see on the computer screen? And of course, the reality is that making an image like this requires many different moving parts. And roughly, the way that this course is organized, we're going to start from the beginning of the story and end with the end. So, the very first thing that you have to do is actually model the scene, right? So this scene is composed of, you know, a vehicle, there's a human character there, there's stuff in the background, probably some hand-painted imagery in the back. And essentially all of these things have to be represented and stored on your computer. So that's where we're going to start in this course, is essentially, even before we talk about how to actually draw something on the screen, we're going to talk about what it means to describe a scene, capture different objects and shapes on the computer, and then eventually sort of convert these different representations into one another. As you can imagine, certain shape representations are really good for artists, right? They want like kind of high level control. And then other shape representations are really good for computers, which want like lots of parallel computing kind of thing. And those are not the same. And so there's like an interesting bridge that we have to uh, cross there in order to describe our scene. After that, well, we have the physical shape of every object. We need to say basically what material they're being made of. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about physics and how light interacts with objects. 
uh, in order to describe the materials and how you're actually going to draw them on your screen. That's all to make a static scene. After that, we need to talk about how to make stuff move. What we're going to see in animation is that there are many different species of animation out there, right? The first one is just like a human drawing a path where some objects should be moving. That's obviously very important. Um, that kind of animation is actually going to reuse some of the geometric representations, you know, namely splines, that we developed in the first part of our course. But in addition to that, there's all kinds of interesting secondary motion and cool stuff that goes on in animated content. And so we'll talk about what it means to do physical simulation. In computer graphics, there's this really funny term that we use a lot called physically based animation. If you think about it, that's like basically a euphemism, right? It's, <laughs> we're not actually doing physics simulation. It's physically based animation because it turns out that humans are often really bad judges of what's physical and what's not. And we can get away with an awful lot in the simulation pipeline and still have a pretty cool looking final shot. Of course, if you're in scientific computing, that's, a, that's sort of verboten. Um, finally, now we have a description of objects, how they absorb and reflect light, and how they interact with one another and move around. The last step is to actually draw it on the screen. <laughs> and so that uh, step of the graphics pipeline is called rendering. Um, and there are many different techniques. We're going to kind of focus on two different rendering algorithms, which are representative in the graphics world. There's ray tracing, which is the sort of slow but accurate one. And then there's rasterization, which is the like fast one on your graphics card. These days, the line between those two is getting blurred quite a bit. Um, so we're going to talk about them as two different algorithms. And we're going to see that in like very modern graphics pipelines, they actually get combined. Like maybe I have some super realistic lighting on this one object. So I do ray tracing over there. And then I do some other part of my scene using rasterization. And then I glue them all together in a final step or something like that. And so roughly, that's what our semester is going to look like. We're just going to go through the graphics pipeline, as it were, from beginning to end here. And so that's our, our overview. We'll start with modeling and transformations. That's going to be where you see all of the matrices you could ever see. In our next lecture, we're going to do a lot of 4x4 four four matrices, but they're actually not going to be used for moving objects around. They're going to be used for describing cubic polynomial curves. Um, that's going to throw you guys a bit of a curveball to get started here. Um, and we'll talk about animation, ray tracing. You're going to write your own ray tracer from scratch for rendering a scene. Um, we're going to talk a lot about ways to accelerate a ray tracer. So the one thing we're going to learn about ray tracing is it's like 10 lines of code to make beautiful images. The only problem is it's like hella slow. So then you need to go back and make your ray tracer fast using assorted uh, algorithmic techniques. Um, and that's where all the headache is going to go in, in actually making one of these tools. And then we're going to kind of take a sideways step and talk about textures and sampling. Um, so a lot of times there's sort of this interesting combination of 2D and 3D stuff that goes into rendering. So for example, these like chairs that you're all sitting on have this like, kind of funky pattern on them. We will probably store that pattern as an image that like gets wrapped around a 3D model. So we'll talk about how that happens on your computer and some of the details of how that interacts with like the pixel grid, which is a really complicated story. Um, sort of two thirds of the way through the, the semester. And then finally, we'll talk about I don't love this phrase. I, oftentimes we talk about graphics pipeline. I think the word pipeline often brings to mind the sort of real time graphics pipeline in your graphics card. Uh, and we'll, we'll sort of see how all this information streams through at this ridiculous frame rate uh, if you're playing a video game or interacting with your computer. A little more detail uh, in the modeling uh, setup. We're going to cover a lot of different things. This includes triangulated surfaces, meshes, all those fun objects that you've probably encountered before as well as splines and other uh, kinds of things. So for example, does anybody recognize this 3D character, by the way? Yeah, does anybody know his name? Jerry. Jerry. Yes, thank you. I, wasn't, I didn't see who that was. But um, yeah, so this is a character from a Pixar animated short. His name is Jerry. It's from Jerry's Game. You should go home and watch it. Um, does anybody know why Jerry's uh, uh, famous in the graphics world, despite being just like a super cute cartoon? That is true. Jerry was among the early uh, animated humans. Um, it, if you've ever watched Pixar's first short, it's like involves like this baby that knocks over a toy, and it like looks like a serial killer. It's like terrifying. <laughs> um, this this is, this is much more convincing and cute. So they did work out the art form, but there's actually very specific technology that that they were kind of testing out. 
Right, so, so Jerry's game was one of the early tests of something called a subdivision surface. Um, so essentially, we're going to cover that in this course. When you're an artist, you don't want to like move every single vertex of like a 20,000 vertex triangle mesh around to animate it. So instead, you want these high-level controls. And one of the ways that you can do that is by having something like this uh, uh, yellow mesh here that you see on the slide, and then kind of moving those vertices. And then there's some procedure that takes this very coarse objects and makes it into something smooth. And so this technology uh, was something that is widely used in the graphics uh, universe starting about 20, 30 years ago. So beyond 3D modeling, we'll talk about transformations. This is one of these things where, of course, now that you have characters, they need to move. So we'll first talk about rigidly moving objects around. That's basically, uh, you might, I, I saw like six different people roll their eyes. Yeah, it feels easy. It's like three by three matrices. But the reality is that actually making algorithms for doing this is a bit of a headache because there's like this stack of transformations that need to happen. Like if I move my hand, you know, really the probably there's like the motion of my body composes the upper arm, the lower arm and so on. And coming up with a data structure that captures all that in an efficient fashion is a giant headache. In fact, every time I code it, I get it wrong. <laughs> so you have the pleasure of doing that on your second assignment. Um, we'll also talk about perspective uh, transformations. Um, you know, the famous example being if you look at a pair of train tracks in a camera, they obviously are parallel in real life, but on the image, they are not. Um, and we'll see that that basically means even though we're doing 3D math, we're going to add a fourth coordinate to all of our computations. This is a standard trick in graphics called homogeneous coordinates. If you happen, there's usually one math student in this course, and I'll get the chance to nerd out with them about like algebraic geometry and, and, and that thing, but I promise we won't do too much of that here. In animation, we'll start by talking about keyframing. Notice we have a lot of uh, images from Pixar. That's not just because I, I once worked there. It actually is because that's where a lot of this technology came from. Um, so here's Lux of the Lamp. He's taking a little hop here. Um, and we'll see that the sort of basic ways of representing an animation is kind of like a curve in the space of rigid motion. So it all you know, fits together with the lectures that came before it. But in addition to that, we'll talk about other animation techniques. So for example, there's something called skinning. So the idea of skinning is that oftentimes animators will control the bones of a digital camera, or digital camera, digital character. But you know, we're not just like a bunch of rigidly glued together parts moving around. There's skin on top that's deforming in some non-rigid way. Now, you could make like a physical simulation that actually simulates your skin, but that would be extremely expensive computationally. So there's some basically computational hacks for deforming a 3D surface in response to a system of bones moving around. And that's this technique called skinning. This happens to be an area that I work in research-wise, so I'm more than happy to tell you about uh, some of the state-of-the-art techniques used uh, in this space. And in addition to that, we'll talk about a different species of animation, which is physically-based animation. So you'll implement on your homework a particle system, which is basically like F equals MA applied to a bunch of different things moving together. Um, and one of the kind of fun things you can do is by engineering interesting forces that couple your particles together, you can simulate different things like cloth, explosions, hair, and so on. And that really is the sort of basic initial step toward some of the big fancy physical simulation systems. Um, we're not going to cover fluid simulation in any detail in this course. That requires way more time and math background than we have. Every year, students implement fluid sim on their homework, and about half of them actually succeed. It's actually one of the harder projects. I, I, I don't know. Um, we will talk about cloth, however, uh, and, and talk about some of the major approaches to uh, cloth simulation, especially that, that show up in video game. Finally, we move on to rendering, actually taking all these digital descriptions and making them into visual content. Here you go. Here's the ray casting, ray tracing algorithm. Um, this is basically the main memo you need to get out of this course. Um, so if you want to draw a scene in 3D, here's how you can do it. You loop over every pixel, and then for each pixel, for each object, find whichever one is closest to that pixel and draw it. <laughs> That's it. That's ray tracing. Um, there's a, in fact, actually, there's this fun Twitter thread the other day. Somebody found the original ray tracing research paper, like the printed version. I, uh, I think Pete Shirley. I encourage you to take a look. It's like a really fun kind of 1970s, 1980s uh, throwback, which means nothing to most of the people in this room. Um, the only problem here is that there's like a giant loop over pixels and objects. And moreover, let's say that like one of these objects happens to be a mirror. <laughs> Well, in order to figure out how to light the mirror, I then have to bounce the ray off and do the whole thing again. Similarly, if I want to do lighting, 
And so you end up with this giant recursive algorithm that sends rays every which way in your scene. And that's really, really slow. And so even though we can make these beautiful images very quickly, or sorry, very beautifully, right, let me try that sentence, we're going to abort that and try again. Even though we can make really beautiful images, it gets really slow. <laughs> there we go. And so uh, we'll then talk about different cool data structures like space partition trees and so on that are going to help make ray tracing fast. The big research question and the one that hopefully one of you guys will solve is how to make those kinds of things compatible with your graphics card because they typically are not. This is more of a CPU style uh, computation. We'll talk about textures. So here's a, uh, what, a hippo, I guess. Um, the 3D model uh, that we use to represent this shape is usually pretty coarse, right? There really aren't that many vertices. He would be a very smooth uh, hippo, but as we all know, they have uh, coarse skin. I have no idea. Um, but <laughs> assuming that that's the case, uh, then what we're going to do is wrap interesting textures around these 3D models to get a more interesting look. And so the way that we're going to do that is in addition to the 3D shape of the object, we're going to store it just like in a JPEG, like an image, a detailed texture as well as the mapping from one into the other and come up with some graphics techniques for sort of lifting texture up to a 3D shape, just like you were to do gift wrap or something like that. We'll talk very briefly in this course about sampling and anti-aliasing. I encourage you to take Fredo's graduate course on computational photography for lots of details on that kind of thing. Um, essentially, there's one big sort of theoretical and sort of practical issue in graphics, right? Which is that the world <laughs> is arguably this like real world, real valued universe, modulo quantum physics. But your screen is not. Your screen is a big grid and every pixel has like a finite number of colors that it can display, right? And so there's something that has to happen in between, right? You have to make a decision for every pixel what color should go inside of that thing. But the problem is like, let's say my screen's really close to my face, I'm looking through this pixel, I see all kinds of colors in that little square. Which single color do I choose to light up on my screen is actually a very challenging question. And there's a lot of really subtle ways to address that question that are really hard to think about. And it's one of these ones where initially you say, oh, you just like take the average or something, and then you realize it's really not that simple. So we're going to talk a bit in a very schematic way about what can go wrong if you undersample, for example. This is called aliasing. So you've probably, like in MS Paint or something, seen lines like this thing on the upper left. Um, this is a sort of bad representation of a straight line, of course. Um, we'll talk about how to fix it and a bit of the theoretical considerations that go into developing these things. Namely, I think the intuition for how to draw this line is like kind of clear, like just blur it out a little bit. But it turns out the precise way that you do that blur is going to matter a lot in terms of how you perceive what's going on on that underlying grid. After that, go back to uh, ray tracing. Here's a typical ray tracer. It's got Reflection, refraction, the kind of typical things that we use to test. You get to code both of those. But it turns out the world is more complicated than that. Namely, light bounces off of all kinds of different surfaces, right? So when you do ray tracing, I like trace a ray through a pixel. I see the first thing it runs into, and that's the color it gets. The reality is that light can take extremely nonlinear paths into your eye, right? It can like bounce off of the floor and then the wall and whatever. And those things are not accounted for in the basic ray tracing uh, algorithm. So we're going to go back and talk about a technique called global illumination, which is the idea that light kind of exists everywhere and is attached to different locations on your scene. Global illumination, what effect do you think it's going to have on your ray tracer? It's going to be even slower. So all these data structures that we'll talk about will matter even more. But you can get cool effects. So for example, the sphere is kind of focusing light onto the, the bottom plane here, which with your basic ray tracer, you can see it's just not something you can capture. Uh, similarly with certain types of soft shadows or the fact that like the blue wall has a slight kind of blue tinge on the floor, all of that kind of detailed stuff that matters. We'll also talk about how to cope with shadows in rendering. There's some really fun shadow algorithms. The ray tracing one is pretty simple. When we talk about rasterization, we're going to have to actually render the scene from the perspective of the light bulb to figure out sort of where the light is hitting the surfaces in the 3D uh, universe and then use that to uh, make a uh, real-time image of something from the perspective of your camera. That algorithm um, is really annoying to code, so of course it's your assignment five. Um, so essentially you're going to make a real-time graphic system with like a light that's like spinning around on top of like a scene with a bunch of columns and things that are occluding each other. 
Um, it's another one where like you're gonna have some annoying sign mistake in your code, I guarantee it, and like the light's gonna move this way and then the shadow's gonna move that way, and it's a whole it's a whole thing. I love looking at the bugs that you guys have. And then finally, we'll talk about the sort of rendering pipeline. So I already told you about ray tracing or ray casting algorithm. We'll then start talking about real-time graphics. And in real-time graphics, there's something called rasterization. And at least from like 9 billion miles away, the difference between the two is just which for loop is around the outside. <laughs> right? So in ray tracing, you loop over every pixel, and you find the first thing that that pixel can see. In rasterization, you go one object at a time in your scene, and you paint it one at a time. And so you can imagine that there's different advantages and disadvantages to both, right? Um, it's going to turn out that ray tracing is really easy for things like shadows. Rasterization, I mean, you can imagine it would be very difficult to deal with shadows because, like, after I've drawn an object, I can't really go back to it. So, like, figuring out if it casts a shadow on something else would be kind of tricky. Uh, and so there's, like, a bunch of hacks that have to happen on the right that don't have to happen on the left. On the other hand, let's say that my scene is composed of one triangle that occupies three pixels. The rasterization triangle uh, algorithm only has to touch those three pixels, right? Whereas ray tracing still has to touch the entire scene. And so that's sort of the principal difference when it comes to uh, efficiency here. So the graphics are really the real-time graphics pipeline. It involves all kinds of clever tricks to do everything in that 29.97 frames per second. Um, and this includes doing you know, transformations to 3D models, clipping things to the view frustum. So in other words, like there's some like cone sitting in front of your eyeball of stuff that you can see, and there's no reason to draw it if, it's, if you can't see it. Um, actually rasterization, which is like lighting up the pixels that are inside of a triangle, and determining visibility, like what's including what. Then finally in this course, uh, we'll have a big grab bag of other stuff that is also considered part of graphics but doesn't fit well into that nice story. Um, this includes uh, perception, I'm not an expert in perception, but I love playing with this stuff. We'll talk about sort of different ways to represent color. Um, you know, it's a fun excuse for me to like share my favorite, you know, optical illusions with all of you. Um, and more importantly, how sort of your visual system goes into how we represent colors of pixels. Right? I mean, I think most people in this room are probably familiar with the fact that when I store an image on my computer, it's really three things, right? It's a red, a green, and a blue color. But if you step back and think about why, you should get yourself a little confused, because there's obviously more than red, green, and blue colors out there in the universe. The reality is that what's going on is we use red, green, and blue specifically because those are the colors that are what your eye can sense, right? And so when we look at, you know, like a yellow color on our screen, there's a really interesting thing happening, which is that your screen is not actually putting out yellow the same way that you would see it like off of a flower, right? What's going on is it's finding some way to activate those three parts of your eye in a way that is identical to that yellow color, specifically for you. So does your dog see the same color as that flower when they look at the screen? Probably not. Uh, and so that's where, where things get pretty interesting. And then we'll conclude with a bit of hard uh, stuff. Uh, display technology, like what goes on actually light up the pixels, and a bit about your GPU. Conveniently, this semester is one lecture shorter. <laughs> than um, MIT's past semesters, and I hate this topic, so I might cut it a, lot, a, a, little, a little short, but you, you didn't hear from me. Okay, so um, our final little uh, point of discussion, and then we'll probably end early, is to just give you a preview of our course assignments to get you excited about the kind of stuff you'll be doing this semester. Um, and then you really can go home, or you don't even have to leave this classroom. You can download assignment zero right here and get started, which I strongly encourage you to do. Um, so essentially, the assignments in this course are going to follow exactly the same story that I just told you. So we're going to start with a quick warm-up just to make sure everything is all set up. You'll have one assignment to do kind of curve and surface modeling, so you'll implement the basic rules for um, uh, polynomial curves and surfaces. Uh, then we're going to have hierarchical models, so you're going to implement a basic skinning technique. Maybe if I'm bored, I'll put in our SIGGRAPH paper from this year as, as an as a <laughs> extra credit, because it's actually not too implement. Um, but essentially what you're going to do is, given like the joint angles of a 3D character, you'll uh, determine uh, where the skin should go in response. You together all of the transformations and then kind of interpolate them uh, to do the, uh, the deformation. Then you'll do a physical simulation assignment. So in particular, you're going to simulate a piece of cloth. Um, so you'll have a little piece of cloth being draped and, and shaking about the corners, and you'll see it kind of falling every which way. And then optionally, you can put a little ball in its way and see the cloth slide over that. 
And that'll be a good kind of representative example in the physical or physically based simulation universe. You're actually going to see that this really is physically based innovation. We're not going to talk about the physics of a piece of cloth. It's which is like weirdly complicated. You have to like tug it in different directions. Um, but rather, we're just going to build it out of a big network of springs and see that that's a kind of reasonable approximation. Now I'm going to turn our uh, attention to rendering. You'll first implement a ray tracer. Uh, this is the assignment that I think the students usually think is the most fun because the basic parts of it are really easy to code. Ray trace is basically just a few formulas in a for loop. And then um, from there, you can like go on the internet, find your favorite physical phenomenon, and try to make it work. And chances are it's not terribly complicated. Um, again, it just comes at the cost of time. And then finally, we'll end uh, with real-time graphics. So you'll write some shaders in OpenGL. And then your basic test case, you're going to have some 3D scene. It's actually more complicated than this one with like a light uh, and a camera moving around and all the shadows and everything else have to move in response to that. So in any event, our first lecture in 6837 is definitely a high enthusiasm, low content kind of experience. Uh, we're going to flip over to the other end of that spectrum on Tuesday, but my hope is not to scare you out of this class. Um, so in the meantime, stay on the lookout. We're going to announce the location for our recitation section with reviews. Um, if you have any questions about this course, let me know. And uh, you can also post questions on Piazza, Slack, or one of the many other things. So with that, I'm going to dismantle our giant setup here, and hopefully I'll see you all on Tuesday. All right. <laughs>